Hey, I'm Nicholas Montez, a musician from Victorville, California, currently based in Redlands. So I had a music class with Mr. O'Rain in like the seventh grade. It was a string ensemble. So I played the violin in that class. That was my first real teaching as far as like an instrument goes. Um, and kind of where some of my musical background goes, comes from I guess. That's the only place where I've ever had any formal training I suppose. And any of the music theory that I do know pretty much comes from that. But I think that kind of gave me a nice in into like the world of music and just being inspired by what, uh, what music, making music feels like. I started working ahead in the books that they would give us um, to try to find the songs that I liked and the ones that I wanted to play. And something I really liked about um, the violin is that it's kind of a percussive instrument at the same time. You can pluck a violin in the same way that you could palm mute a guitar or hit a drum. Prior to all of that, I did play drums for a little while, so all the drums were self-taught. The desire to play drums probably did somewhat come from my cousin Adam. So I remember my cousins lived out in Ohio, so we would take visits over there during the summer. Um, and I remember the first time I saw my cousin Adam's room, he had like a super cool bed, he had like a computer in the corner, um, and he was like learning to write code. Then he'd hop over and start playing the drums. And I remember him playing. He played Scooby-Doo one time on the drums. And I was like, man, that's cool. Interesting song choice. But <laughs> that was it right there, man. That's <laughs> super funny. I think that I just kind of aspired to be kind of like him. Um, he was a couple years older than me. And I just thought it was really cool when he broke out the drums. And I think that's kind of where my drive to want to play that instrument came from. Yeah, I definitely found instruments to be an outlet, especially drums. Throughout my entire time of playing drums, I felt that it's the best way to relieve some stress, that's for sure. And when you come home from a long day of work or school or whatever it may be, banging it out on the drums is like the most therapeutic thing you could possibly do. But I think it's also cool just like being able to, to hear a song that you like and then, you know, even if you don't know music theory or how notes work together or anything like that, like drums, you can just hear the rhythm and kind of hear that sounds like a snare, that sounds like a hi-hat, and then start learning the rhythms. Down the line, I ended up going over to the Victorville Library one day and picked up um, like a how to drum book. Went home and told my siblings I wanted to start a band. <laughs> and it was like myself, my brother and my sister for about a day. We wrote one song <laughs> and then just like never, you know, kind of put it away. I just feel like my, my desire to be a musician kind of was always there, but I was a little ashamed of it for some reason. Like I was almost embarrassed by the fact that I wanted to be, that I wanted to sing or that I wanted to start a band or something like that. And then finally one day in, in sometime in high school, something just like clicked with me. I had discovered early on in high school like indie music in general. So bands like Born Ruffians and Arctic Monkeys. And then one day, I think I was browsing YouTube and I, I looked up Arctic Monkeys or something like that and I saw their like Suck It and See a music video or something like that from that album and then dove down into that rabbit hole of that whole Suck It and See album. I remember walking around my high school one day with my headphones in and Reckless Serenade came on and I heard the bass line and immediately as it like went into my ears, that was the first time I felt like, wow, bass line could be sexy, you know, it's like, oh, that's a, that's a really nice bass line. It made me feel something. So I feel like that album just opened my eyes to like what's possible within music. And then I just started trying to write songs because I wanted more of that. I wanted more of that album. Um, and so I think originally like that was my plan was I was gonna write another Arctic Monkeys album. Your Westie started maybe my sophomore year of high school. I had a couple friends who I knew uh, were down to like support me in that and play some music, so Sal and Brandon. And we just kind of tried to piece together a band. So that was kind of the origin of Your Westies. That was the band that would eventually become Your Westies. While we went through a lot of different members, those were the guys that kind of started it. We decided I was going to be the singer, but I was having a hard time drumming and playing, uh, like singing at the same time. So we decided it'd be easier if I was the guitarist. And so I taught my friend Sal drums and he taught me guitar and we switched. After the uh, rehearsal that we had for the first time, we went to go watch a movie. Um, and as we get into the car with Sal's dad driving us, since none of us could drive yet, he introduced us as like, hey dad, this is my band. And that was the first time that I had like that identifier, I guess, of like, oh, I'm in a band. Um, and I think, again, like wanting to be a band had to do with, it kind of sucks to say, but to a certain extent, it does have to do with like the ego or the image or whatever it may be. But I think I've found so much more than just, you know, validation from other people through playing music. Even at first, I remember thinking that I couldn't write music. I started asking my older brother, Joseph, like, hey, if you were to, could you write songs for me? And then I could just play them. Like, I just wanted to at least perform them, you know? And then as time started going on, I started realizing more and more that I could. So I would usually start with like 
some sort of concept. And sometimes they were as silly as like a skeleton. Skeleton's gonna be my concept. And then I would think of, I would draw like on a piece of paper, like all of these bubbles, like almost like a bubble map you do in elementary school. It says, all right, what are some cool words that revolve around a skeleton, like bones or chilling or different adjectives maybe. But yeah, I would try to come up with some sort of concept of this is what I wanna write about and I'm gonna use metaphors to tie love to a skeleton or whatever it may be. And then just start trying to write lines that sounded cool and rhymed. I was trying so hard to sound like somebody else. I was trying to sound like the bands that I listened to or different artists who I appreciated the voices of. But I started learning at some point, um, even after recording quite a few songs with your Westies, that my voice was not necessarily fit for what they were trying to do. Um, and so I started having to try to figure out who I was as a singer, um, listening to my own inflections within my voice. Um, whether it's the pace at which I speak or the way I pronounce certain words or whatever it may be And then I started turning my singing more into a caricature of that So I started emphasizing the things that I liked within my own voice The first concert I went to um, Avid Dancer was the opener and I, before the show I was trying to look up music to try to see like what these guys sound like so I could see who the opener was I didn't see anything um, and no social media presence. And then I go to another show a couple months later down the line and once again, Avid Dancer was opening for the, for the band playing that night. And I really liked the stuff that they were doing live and I eventually was able to find like their Instagram and I believe I was maybe their fourth follower. Um, and so I was kind of baffled as to how this band who didn't have any sort of online presence or music out that I could find was getting shows with all of my favorite bands. And so I just decided to send them a message and try to see I ended up linking up with um, the, the singer of that band, Jacob Summers. So he wanted to hear our recorded music, but I let him know, oh, we don't actually have anything recorded. I was just curious, like, how you guys are getting shows. And he was like, oh, I could record you guys. I record bands all the time. And so that was kind of how we established that connection there. It was just randomly sent out that message and just trying to figure out how to play shows in LA and ended up with like a sort of like a studio session. I remember going home and talking to my mom and talking with Victor about like whether we were gonna put out all this money to do this studio session. And he was actually very, very understanding with the fact that we didn't have a lot of money at the time when I was in high school. Victor was the only one working in the band. Um, so he ended up cutting us a really good deal. Um, and we thought it was a worthwhile investment. We would just do one song, see what the experience is like in the studio, um, and just try to bring our best and see if that's something that we'd wanna pursue. We decided to bring Oh My to the studio. Um, and we worked with Jacob Summers and Leif Davidson of Avid Dancer um, at Gypsy Sound in LA. So this was our first studio experience and going in there was just absolutely mind blowing. All of the equipment there was just way above my pay grade, that's for sure. We got a really awesome opportunity there to kind of hear ourselves the best we had ever heard ourselves before. So we had only played on mediocre equipment and in small rooms or um, never really like mic'd up or anything like that. So this was the first time that we were able to hear ourselves crystal clear on some really nice equipment. And he really helped us to shape that song into what it is now. While the general structure was the same, the feel of the song was not a very dancey song um, in the beginning. And so he really helped us to like push it in the right direction. So that song being our first studio experience was extremely nerve wracking, like trying to play our parts and knowing that this is gonna be it forever when, you're, when you record the piece. Basically after that recording session with Omai, oh we were just incredibly happy with the way this song came out and this new sound that we sort of had, it was just re us reinvented um, through the studio. Everything after that point on Baby Hush was written following that first studio session, so Bad was next up and I really started writing that song with like our studio sound in mind, thinking like this is what we sound like as a band, this is your Westies. And so then I wrote Bad, we worked on uh, Push Down, Pulled Back, Up on the Shelf, and No No Better. Um, and you know, over the span of maybe a year and a half or so, recorded the rest of those in sessions over at Gypsy Sound. So after the first EP, I messaged Jacob again sometime down the road and let him know that we had a couple new songs that we were interested in reporting. Um, I was wondering if he would, would uh, be able to work with us again. And so he, he let us know that he was actually doing a lot of like home recording at the time. Um, or like he would do it in different spots, so maybe like an Airbnb in Joshua Tree or wherever it may be. Um, and so he was actually moving to a new house on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood and was like, hey, I'm moving this weekend. Maybe what we can do is just turn one of the rooms into a studio for the weekend. You guys can bring any equipment that you guys think is interesting that you have that's unique. I'll bring all my favorite stuff. Um, we'll just set up shop there and record. 
So we were working on what would eventually become Only Child and A Better Place to Sleep, but very different versions of them at the time, um, and not the versions that we actually have out today. During that process, we had a great time and I think we learned a lot through it, but the stress of <laughs> recording on a time crunch um, could just be a lot. So we were trying to do a song per day. So while we were there for three days that weekend, first day was like hanging out, second day we had to knock out a song, and the, you know, the third day, knock out the last song, and there was just not a lot of time to breathe in that process. Um, and while he did a really great job as a producer and like trying, getting us to produce, I suppose, it was just too much of a time crunch for us. Maybe we didn't go in with as much of an idea as we needed to. Or perhaps maybe like when you work with the producer, you have to give up a certain part of your, your vision, I guess, for that song to a certain extent. And I think that maybe just because of the speed that things were going, it just took a different direction for us. And we decided that we wanted to give those songs another try at some point. After this whole uh, recording session at Jacob's house, I think it really opened our eyes to the fact that you could do this anywhere, that you didn't really need a fancy studio in order to um, get your songs across, I suppose. While all of those things are very nice and it will make you sound the best you could possibly be, if you're willing to embrace a little bit of like lo-fi charm, um, I think you can basically set up a studio space anywhere you want to. Um, and so after that experience, we walked away from it thinking, you know, if we do this ourselves and if we learn how to do this ourselves, we won't be on such a time crunch anymore. It's not a song per day. We can spend as much time as we want doing the part again or trying a different part or scrapping that style of a song and trying it a different way. Um, and so we were really drawn to the self-recording sort of idea. So our guitarist, Louis, just took it upon himself to learn everything. Seemingly overnight, one day he was just like, hey, I think I could record this, let's, let's try it out. And so we decided to give A Better Place to Sleep another try. So our control room was kind of upstairs in Louis's room and Aaron's downstairs in his little dungeon. And he's able to hear us through some like headphones and through the, the mics on the drums. And we just kind of communicate to him through there and just created our own little drum booth. And so he would play the tracks down there as Victor recorded direct in his bass and kind of get the, the rhythm locked in. Then when it comes to like guitars and vocals, we would maybe set up shop in a restroom if we wanted more of an echoey effect or in a closet if we want to mute it a little bit more. Um, and just different areas throughout the house where you can kind of isolate yourself and get, get different sounds depending on where you're at. That experience of recording A Better Place to Sleep was just absolutely eye-opening because that's one of my favorite of our songs and it was the very first shot that we had at it and uh, Louis' production absolutely blew me away on that. But I think it really embraced just who we really were as a band. Like this was every step of the way was like our own decision. Um, and I think that we got to spend as much time as we possibly wanted on it as well. Following A Better Place to Sleep, we decided to just keep recording songs ourselves and keep working on, uh, you know, whatever our favorite song was at the time. So we started slowly building momentum, recording song after song until it got to the point where we were like, let's just make a, like, let's just keep doing more. Let's make a big project and see what it turns into. And so we just started hashing out all these old songs that we had been playing over the years and reworking them or rewriting certain things or taking apart and turning into something new. And eventually ended up with a compilation of songs that ended up being, uh, it doesn't last. It was just meant to be a collection of like, you know, this is all the stuff that we've been missing over the years, the stuff that we never recorded, and now we finally have the means to just do it as often as we possibly want. Um, so we just chose all our favorites and loaded them into one project. Um, a lot of that is credited to our guitarist, Louie, but I know that he learned the majority of it through YouTube videos, and I would watch a video here and there and send it his way for like tips or tricks of interesting things that you can do, but I think that the internet's your best friend when it comes to learning how to produce yourself. As far as the group, we don't have anything necessarily in the works at the moment. We have a couple demos here and there that um, we'll spend time on in our free time or we'll shoot each other, you know, a, a snippet here and there. But we don't really have necessarily like a song or a show that we're working towards at the moment. Um, so I'm really just trying to make the most of my time here in my new home and really trying to embrace, I guess, myself as a musician, just trying to figure out what that means, grow some more confidence within myself, play my guitars more often, try to read and learn and write more music. I'm hoping to start doing more covers. I think that, first of all, every time I've ever learned a cover, I end up writing a song out of that process because you start learning um, all these tricks that other musicians may use as to 
you know, a chord that you never would have thought to use or whatever it may be. But I'm trying to learn as many songs as I can just to kind of play more often. Um, and I think that I will probably do some sort of live streams or you know, Instagram videos or TikToks or something where I just play songs that I love uh, as far as like other artists material. And if, you know, in the process, if I end up coming up with my own stuff, I think solo music is something that I've always been interested in. Your Westies is like my favorite thing in the world, basically, and my baby. So it's hard for me to not want to share a great song that I've written with the band. I'm trying to find that balance between what would mean, what would it even mean to have like a Nick Montez solo song or project, but something that I'm definitely interested in. I would hope what the future holds for me as far as music is just more good times, I suppose, like just documenting it for the most part. Like that's my end goal. I started music because I wanted more, I wanted more music in the world. I wanted more that I could enjoy and listen to. Um, and that's still my goal ultimately. I'm definitely your, your Westie's number one fan. <laughs> I listen to our own music all the time um, because I genuinely enjoy it and I think that that's mission accomplished for me. I just I just want to keep putting out what I enjoy and if others like it too then that's just, you know, that's the added bonus there. I think for an aspiring musician I would just say like work with what you've got. Um, if you don't have the best equipment in the world you can use that. If you don't have the means to pay for studio time you can do it on your iPhone or do it on a MacBook or your laptop or whatever you have. I think that the world of making music these days is just so accessible and so easy. Um, and there's examples of it everywhere. People like Steve Lacey or Billie Eilish or whoever it may be that are just recording in their bedrooms or recording on their phones or computers. And now to close out this episode, I'll be performing one more time by your Westies.